What has happened, everybody? James Hancock here. I'm back for a little discussion of Transformers, Rise of the Beasts. And the reason I say discussion and not review is because reviewing these movies is a largely pointless exercise. The people who love the Transformers are not reading reviews or listening to reviews to decide whether or not they want to go. The question is, it's kind of like the Fast and the Furious franchise. You're either in or you're out. And the question is not whether or not they're like individually good movies. The question is, how do they measure up to the rest of the franchise? And that's exactly what I'm going to do with this discussion. I'm going to go over the good, the bad, and the horrific. And I have to apologize in advance. If my voice sounds a little off or just my ability to kind of focus on the camera seem a little off, it's because New York right now is choking under this giant cloud of smoke that's drifting down from all the wildfires in Canada. I don't know if people have seen the pictures online, but New York has looked like something out of the apocalypse for like the last day and a half. And so it's about 95 degrees in here because I can't use my window AC unit because it just blasts in all the... Um, the pollution so it's hot and it's dry anyway we're going to do our best to power through so getting back to transformers rise of the beast if you're unfamiliar with just the basics transformers rise of the beast it's a sequel to the bumblebee film from 2018 but it's a prequel to the 2007 transformers movie and it takes place in 1994 it draws a lot of inspiration from a series that was after my time i mean i was like their day one 1984 with the comic with the toys with the cartoon uh, i'm an og transformers fan but the beast war storyline apart from a few clips on youtube i'm largely unfamiliar with. But the Beast Wars series had a completely different look from the 1984 cartoon, ran for a couple seasons, but the series gave birth to a bunch of new characters, namely the Maximals, which are the good guys, and the Terracons, who are the bad guys, which all appear in this flick. And the Terracons are actually working at the behest, or they're in liege to the mighty Unicron, who was first seen in the Transformers movie from 1986, famously voiced by Orson Welles. And the plot of the movie is pretty simple. you got a few human characters played by Anthony Ramos and Dominique Fishback, and they have to team up with the Autobots, led by Optimus Prime, as well as the Maximals, in order to save the world from being destroyed or consumed by Unicron. But when it comes to the cast, I should mention that in addition to Peter Cullen, who is back as Optimus Prime, I mean, this guy's in his 80s at this point. He's been playing Optimus Prime since 1984, but he's back. But you've also got stars like Ron Perlman, Peter Dinklage, Michelle Yeoh, and Pete Davidson. And yeah, there's a lot of Pete Davidson. Your mileage may vary on whether or not you like Pete Davidson. I feel like when he's got the right part, like something like Bodies, 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 then he can be incredible. But when he's in a part which may or may not be a perfect fit, he can be a little grating, a little shrill. But once again, I'll, I'll let everybody else decide how they feel about Pete Davidson. For me, I can kind of take him or leave him. But if I were to try and sum up my reaction to this movie or my feelings about this movie in just a few words without getting kind of like into the weeds and all the details, I would say... It is no better or no worse than a lot of what's come before. I mean, there is a giant battle at the end, which is a ton of fun to watch. But there's also a lot of idiocy to get there, which is you know nothing new for the Transformers franchise. I feel like with, with all seven of these movies, they basically find people where they were deprived of oxygen as children and are semi-illiterate or just have horrible storytelling instincts and say, Write the most annoying human characters that you possibly can, and we'll sprinkle in some classic robots that people know and love. And with all seven of these movies, I just want to say, remove the human characters entirely. Like with the show back in the day, had a few human human characters, but they're on the side, they're on the fringe. They were not they were not featured front and center. And I know some people are going to say, well, it's really expensive to have the robots front and center every step of the way. Well, then bring down kind of the uh, the special effects budget and just go for a more traditional animated style. Transformers the movie in 1986 managed to go from beginning to end with very few human characters just fine. But for me, going back to 2007, that's always been the Achilles heel of these flicks. They call them live action movies. They're not live action. All the robots are digital creations. It's basically an animated movie with a few human characters. But if you want to call it live action, my main complaint with the live action movies is that the writing is just absolutely horrific. And ordinarily, I would say that these movies are incapable of converting new fans. However, I'm going to contradict myself because in my row behind me, I saw, I saw the flick at this incredible Dolby Theater up at um, the AMC in Lincoln Square here in New York. But there's a row of kids behind me, and they were talking a mile a minute. And I couldn't tell if they were talking because they were bored or if they were talking with excitement of what was going on on the screen. I'm assuming one or two of them are like the experts. I was explaining what's going on to all their friends. So somehow, by some miracle, I mean, these kids, they must have been born inside the last 10 years. So well, like five years after the first Transformers movie even came out in 2007, 
which is kind of amazing to me because without the nostalgia factor, I don't know if I could sit through these. Because for me, if I get like 10 seconds where it looks and feels like the Transformers movie that I want to see, like a perfect example, the beginning of Bumblebee. There's a moment where Soundwave and Starscream show up and they're about to attack uh, Optimus Prime and Bumblebee. And I was like, holy shit, like for a brief shining moment, it's just as badass and epic and cool as I would as I would want a Transformers movie to be. Then of course they go to Earth and humans start talking and it becomes, you know, a terrible movie to watch. But I will sit through all these movies for those brief shining moments where I get to see villains that I really like because I'm all about the villains with all these big franchises. But for these kids, nostalgia is clearly not a factor. I don't know how old you have to be to feel nostalgic about anything, but these kids were like under the age of 10, so I feel like nostalgia, they probably haven't even heard the word yet. So on some level, these movies are clearly working. But for me, the peak of the franchise would have to just be that period from 1984 to 1986. And it was around 1986 where I discovered two things at the same time, skateboarding and girls. And I immediately quit playing with Masters of the Universe. I quit playing with Transformers. I quit playing with G.I. Joe. I stopped watching all those shows. And then the following year, Nintendo arrived. So once Nintendo arrived, the, like, the idea of like toys or like Hasbro cartoons or any of that stuff was like the furthest thing from my brain, especially when I had like Dungeons and Dragons on the horizon and things like that. So yeah, when, when you're a kid, your interests are constantly changing. But I will say this, the intro to the classic cartoon is still like some of my favorite 30 seconds of animation ever. That song is incredible. At age 46, that song can still give me goosebumps. And I really love that uh, the, the first couple issues of the comic with that classic Bill Sienkiewicz cover. And of course, the movie 1986 is totally badass. Like I know now I know it was like a marketing ploy or a scheme to kill off all the famous characters in order to launch a bunch of new toys. But when I, but when I watch it now, I'm like, oh my God, like what, what creative courage to kill off everybody's favorite characters like in the first 20 minutes to pave the way for a bunch of new characters. Like it's kind of awe-inspiring just how good the first like 20, 30 minutes of the 1986 movie have like continued to be after all these decades, just because you had a bunch of greedy assholes saying, kill off other characters, we want to launch new toys, and at any rate, I don't know what happened to the Transformers after that. From basically 1986 to 2007, I took a nice 21 year break, but I still get goosebumps when I hear Peter Cullen say, Megatron must be stopped, no matter the cost. Megatron must be stopped, no matter the cost. <laughs> Let's just pause for a moment and sing Peter Cullen's praises. And they had a great little documentary before this movie started where there was a brief interview and he was talking about his initial audition for the character back in like 83 or whenever it was. And his brother was a Marine. And Peter Cullen told his brother, I'm auditioning for a part where he's a truck. And his brother was like, all right, that's ridiculous. And he said, but no, but he's a warrior and he's a leader. And suddenly his brother got really serious and he said, if you're going to be a leader, be strong enough to be gentle. And I was like, wow, that's like the best way to describe Optimus Prime. He is gentle and he's wise and he's patient, but he's also fucking vicious. Like without Optimus Prime, the fucking Autobots would lose every single battle. It's usually like a situation where like maybe Bumblebee has a few tricks up his sleeve, but most people just get their asses kicked and then Optimus Prime shows up and mops the floor with all the bad guys. And in this interview, you see Peter Cullen going into Optimus Prime's voice and he can still fucking do it. Like I would assume that like a bunch of computers or like special effects were enhancing his voice, but he is still clear. He is still dynamic. He can absolutely get into character when the moment calls for it. And what's incredible about Peter Cullen's acting skills is that he can make even clunky dialogue sound amazing because it's not like the screenwriters in all these movies like write bad screenplays but then save all the good lines and just give them to Optimus Prime. The screenplays are terrible. I mean they are like they're completely rotten to the core and yet Optimus Prime is awesome in every single one of them. He's got moments of gravitas and courage and bravery where he gives you like you know goosebumps and he, he inspires you and that is all on Peter Cullen's shoulders because, once again, he is working with the world's worst material, but somehow through the sheer force of his voice acting talent, he's able to elevate otherwise humdrum material and deliver just solid gold every time. But he's got some help this time around. I would say that Ron Perlman was pretty goddamn good as Optimus Primal. Pete Davidson is fine as Mirage. I feel like that was good casting, but I miss the days where you had great character actors like Scatman Crothers playing characters like Jazz, like, holy shit, pitch perfect casting. Maybe the best casting in the history of the franchise, although Megatron and Starscream are pretty goddamn good as well back in the day. But I liked hearing Peter Dinklage as Scourge, but Scourge is a similar problem to all the other Transformers movies where, for whatever reason, every time they design the villains, they always make the faces as like, unexpressive or inexpressive. Anyway, their faces lack expressive qualities 
And when you watch the cartoon from like the mid 80s, I mean, all the villains were incredibly expressive. It made them very charismatic. It made them very engaging. And I don't know why this is such a recurring problem throughout all seven of the movies. Like you have the five Michael Bay movies, you had whoever did Bumblebee, and now you've got this new director, uh, do, 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 Stephen Capel Jr., who directed this. Stephen Capel Jr., the only thing I'd seen by him before was Creed II, which I thought was the weakest of the three Creed movies. But it was fine. It was a perfectly adequate Creed movie, but not the best. And I would say His Rise of the Beasts is a perfectly adequate Transformers movie. It's not as ridiculous or as annoying or over the top as Michael Bay's films. I mean, Michael Bay, good God, like that is a director where I have to think long and hard to name one single movie by him. I guess like the Bad Boys movies, one and two, are probably his best flicks, but I kind of loathe and despise Michael Bay, although I do have a soft spot for The Rock, but his style of filmmaking, I got real tired of it with the five Transformers movies that he made. And so I wouldn't say Rise of the Beast is like Michael Bay dumb, but it's like a different flavor of dumb. And that blame lays on the shoulders of five screenwriters, Joby Harold, Darnell Mateer, Josh Peters, Eric Haber, Heber, and John Haber, or Heber. They must be a brother-sister, brother-brother writing duo in any event. When it comes to the writing, I don't want to belabor the obvious, but I almost feel like if there were ever a justification for using AI to write screenplays, this will be it. Like I know like the writer's guild right now is on strike, and one of the big things they're striking against is the potential use of AI, where it's like, all right, well then write better movies and write better shows, and then no one will feel compelled to use AI. Or my recommendation would be don't use AI and don't use bad screenwriters. Like I would rather just watch like a two-hour action scene or like even a 20-minute action scene with no dialogue of any kind because that would be superior to listening to this dialogue like just go pure visual storytelling and it probably would be more emotionally impactful than this the sheer dreck these writers have cooked up throughout this entire series and maybe the the biggest share of the blame goes to the producers don murphy tom DeSanto, lorenzo di bonaventura i mean these are uh producers that have been with the franchise every step of the way or at least the, the live action movies as well as michael bay so at any rate somebody deserves to blame for these idiotic words that are coming out of the characters mouths but in addition to the crummy dialogue, there's some other storytelling problems like the whole idea of the Transformers is that it's robots in disguise. And when they come to Earth, they take on the form of trucks and planes and that sort of thing to fit in. And then, of course, they have their battles for you know, energy sources and the fate of the planet, et cetera, and so forth. But if you go back to the very first episode of the Transformers, which I watched a couple days ago just like on a sentimental journey, on their home world of Cybertron, the Autobots and Decepticons, they have different shapes, they have different forms. They have like these weird alien, like futuristic vehicles that they are these different forms they use because they haven't gone to Earth yet. They haven't learned those forms. But when they go to Earth, they take on those forms to fit in. So long story short, you've got the, uh, the Maximals in this flick on another planet but they're already in the form of the creatures on Earth, which for me makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. Like, why would you have a gorilla on a planet that, once again, they don't show like the life forms on that planet, but I doubt they have life forms that are identical to that of Earth. When they got to Earth, they would take on those forms in order to fit in. Like, once again, it's in the goddamn theme song, Robots in Disguise. And so that kind of stuff, I just feel like it's sloppy and it's stupid. And Bumblebee had the same problem. Even though I love that opening bit on Cybertron with a big-ass battle, already Bumblebee was riding around like a car from Earth. It's like, you haven't been to Earth yet. Like, you don't even know what a car is. Take on another shape. But enough beating up on the screenplay. Let's talk about some good qualities. Because this movie is set in 1994, it gave him a chance to indulge in some rare 90s nostalgia. And I'm loving seeing how 90s nostalgia is slowly becoming a thing because I feel like we've had like we've had like 30 years of 80s nostalgia. I feel like the 80s was only one decade. We don't need decades upon decades of 80s nostalgia. I'm ready for some 90s nostalgia. And there are some cool needle drops in this from the period, like uh, LL Cool J, Mama Said Knock You Out. We've also got Tribe Called Quest. We've got Wu-Tang Clan. We've got Notorious B.I.G. Like, I thought, because the two main human characters come from Brooklyn, the music seemed very, like, spot on when it came to setting the tone and the place. And what was cool about watching this movie in New York, admittedly, I was in Manhattan, not in Brooklyn, 
but anytime they made a reference to anything New York related or showed any sort of pride in New York whatsoever, the crowd would just erupt in thunderous applause. So that was a lot of fun to be exposed to. And just to keep the good feelings going, I just want to emphasize once again, the final battle in this is pretty goddamn wild, where most of the characters at least get like a big hero moment. Some get kind of neglected. Like there are a few characters in this where you're like, why are you even in the movie? Like you had like a few lines, but we didn't even see you like in the final battle, but like, RC is a lot of fun to watch in action. She just has a different way of moving and has a very distinctive look. So it's cool seeing her in action. There was a moment where Bumblebee drops into action where the crowd went fucking crazy. Like I, I didn't quite realize just how much people love the character of Bumblebee. I mean, I liked him back in the day, but I mean, if I'm being totally honest as a kid, as much as I liked Optimus Prime, I always liked the villains a lot more. I thought Shockwave was scary as hell looking. Megatron was fucking awesome, and he would turn into a goddamn gun that was like, you know, life-size so you could run around and play with. Love Starscream and how he's always trying to take Megatron's spot, and he has the same voice actor as Cobra Commander. And I love Soundwave. In terms of like, favorite toys of all time, Soundwave would be a contender because you had the little miniature Decepticons that you could pop into the tape deck or pop out and have them go into combat. I just thought he was so cool. And he had a really cool voice. Once again, the voice acting in the 80s cartoon, while the animation is pretty rudimentary, but the voice acting was so good. These characters are beloved many decades later. And one of the best parts about Bumblebee was like the three seconds where Soundwave spoke. I was like, whoa, like they really, they really nailed him. Decepticons. Attack. But for my last comment, I do have to go into some spoiler terrain, so if you've not yet seen it and plan on seeing it, bail out now because this is definitely something that's going to be teeing up future movies in the franchise, but uh, it's already all over the internet, so it's not really that much of a spoiler, but this flick opens the door to a giant crossover between Transformers and G.I. Joe, and I feel like G.I. Joe as a franchise has, like Transformers, really struggled. It hasn't struggled as much in terms of like generating successful movies, but creatively, I feel like G.I. Joe is at its best with like, you know, the first couple dozen issues of the comic, like up through Sepentor, like that was incredible. The action figures I thought were much more fun to play with. They just they just moved really well. Like Transformers, you could kind of transform them, but then they were kind of stiff. But as a little kid, playing with G.I. Joe, they were incredible. But story-wise, I think I preferred the G.I. Joe show, but when it came to movies, I think Transformers had a much stronger flick. However, in 2009, there was a brilliant uh, animated movie, G.I. Joe Resolute, written by Warren Ellis, which I really did enjoy. So if you're a, a sucker or a buff for G.I. Joe, definitely check it out. But obviously, Hasbro would like nothing more than to have a thriving G.I. Joe shared universe or a series of films that could occasionally dip in and out of the Transformers world. I mean, first and foremost, I would just tell them, get a good G.I. Joe movie out there, make it work, make people fall in love with the characters again, and then start setting up your universe and your crossovers with Transformers and that sort of thing. I feel like when you try to set up your universe before your movies, that's where you get into trouble. And I feel like, yeah, if if it ain't on the page, it ain't on the stage, and I think we need one kick-ass G.I. G. I. Joe movie before we see them teaming up with Optimus Prime for anything. But I'm open to it. I mean, it's, it's embarrassing to admit, but at the very end when this character shows a business card that says G.I. Joe on it, got like little little chills up my arm because, you know, I was the perfect target audience for the toy and the cartoon and the comic and all that shit when it all came out. It was just a great time to be a kid. But just as a way of bringing this conversation to a close, no matter how bad or good these movies are, whether they're Transformers or G.I. Joe or whatever, I will probably always continue to show up just to see what they're doing with these characters because they came along at such like a, a pivotal, kind of impressionable point in my young life. And I'm never expecting any of them to be masterpieces or great movies or anything like that. But it is nice when one goes the extra mile. I can't say Rise of the Beast goes the extra mile, but I did have a few moments that I did enjoy. So did I get my money's worth? Maybe. But um, anyway, I'm never expecting these movies to be classic cinema, like a movie like the French Connection, which I bought on Blu-ray today as a, a fuck you to Disney because apparently they've been censoring the film and not telling anybody. Like, even if you bought the film digitally in the past, they've gone in and changed the code. So if you bought the film on iTunes five years ago because Disney bought Fox and Fox had the right to French Connection, Disney is now censoring movies without telling anybody. And they, they just got found out about uh, this one. I guess we'll have to wait and see if they've been dabbling with any other movies. But at any rate, I don't expect this movie to be as good as the French Connection, but if you not seen the French Connection before or in a long time, 
buy the Blu-ray and watch the uncensored version. But I've officially uh, gone off topic, so let me wrap this up. Hope you enjoyed this video. If so, please hit that notification bell to be notified about future content or hunt me down on Twitter. I just got my Twitter account back after two and a half years of being suspended, so I'm now at Colbrax again on Twitter. So uh, give me a shout and say hello and all that good stuff. But I hope everybody has a great weekend, but more importantly, as always, onwards and upwards.